Okay, welcome everybody. It's uh, it's that time. This is uh, John Seville from uh, Acorn Wealth Corp. We're going to kick off for our uh, evening's Profitable Trades and Targets workshop. Uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for spending your uh, evening with us or morning, depending on where in the world you are. This is going to be a really great time. Um, I've been talking about the importance of smart money now and incorporating uh, the detection of it in trading setups for uh, for years, and, and especially in the months leading up to the market conditions we're currently seeing because of how big of a uh, uh, factor it plays into predicting major market shifts. Uh, we've got some really big players playing in the market right now, the, one of the biggest battles of bulls versus bears that we've seen probably since 2010. Um, in the EU crisis, so uh, what we're going to talk about tonight is particularly important to what's going on in the market today. Uh, real quickly, of course, before we get too far into that, uh, just the standard disclaimer, um, I'll be talking about some of the uh, stocks we've recently been covering as well as some of the uh, uh, stocks even that we're currently in, um, potentially, at the end of the tonight. So. Uh, there's your standard financial display. I'm sure you've seen something like this before, just saying that stock trading does involve risk, but I'm sure that's nothing new that I'd teach you tonight. <laughs> um, so a little bit about us. Uh, for those of you who don't already know us, we were founded back in 2007 by a small group of traders, including myself. Uh, we focused uh, mostly on the technical side of the market, and um, by tracking things like the smart money, that'll, that term, will, you'll hear that a lot today, um, we were able to detect key exit signals uh, that the smart money was offloading their stock and uh, we got a signal of that on June 6, 2008, allowing us to step aside and the students that were following uh, those signals to step aside uh, from that crash as well and short the market, as well as the EU crisis in 2010. Uh, it also gave us these same warning signals in late December uh, of course, uh, ahead of the uh, emerging market breakdown. So um, this is kind of where we really shine, is uh, looking at the technical reading uh, of the shifts that are going on in the market. So let's start a little bit out with um, what's going on in the world. Uh, I'm sure this is nothing new to anyone who's been following the news, but we do have a extremely tumultuous time going on. You've got the central banks obviously pumping money into the economy, no end in sight. Uh, you've got the, uh, uh, the suspicion that, well, is this really a rally? Uh, is true economic activity really going on? Um, or, uh, or can we really just spend our way uh, out, of, out of a problem and, um, uh, and print money on the walls? Now, when we entered 2014, for those of you who follow sites such as Stock Twits and, and things like that, uh, you may also have noticed that uh, I think one of the sentiment readings on Stock Twits, is, which is a community of traders, 96% or more uh, traders were going into 2014 with bullish sentiment. Uh, if that isn't an overboard indicator, I don't know what is. Uh, and as a contrarian trader, uh, that's a sign to do the opposite for me. Um, so we've got those warning signs, of course. And furthermore, optimism amongst ma major market players. All warning signs when uh, things are getting toppy. Uh, let's have a look at what things were getting toppy. Well, new technologies like cloud computing and technology have been the main market leaders. Uh, the Yelps of the world, Amazon, things like that, things that have just kept going up. Um, not the brick and mortar companies, but the, the cloud computing companies. Um, and the darling investment that uh, most analysts were placing all their faith in uh, last year crumbled and fell apart and potentially is continuing to do so. So the questions we have to ask is, hey, what's, what's the plan uh, going into this? What if the market does recover? If this isn't the sky is falling, then what's the plan if that occurs and how do you recognize it? Uh, and of course, the opposite to that, what, what if it isn't? What if this is really a major breakdown. Did you have these concerns in 08 and didn't act fast enough? Did you recognize it before it happened? Uh, you know, all key questions that uh, I, would, I would pose are important, vital even, to have in your strategy if we're going to make the most out of the opportunity this volatility is providing and at the very least and, and, and most importantly uh, protect against potential major losses by being on the wrong side of uh, big moves. Um, 
This is a pretty standard question I like to ask uh, everyone right at the outset, uh, and because it, it does uh, dramatically change group to group, uh, as you may be surprised to know. Uh, obviously, there's three types of main categories of traders that are that are usually in part of these types of workshops. Uh, day traders, of course, the most active, uh, the most like a, a job. Your job is trading, and you sit in front of the computer. You're looking for small moves, five cents, ten cents, uh, sometimes more, sometimes less. We're just getting in and out. Don't care what the company does. Just purely looking for price movement and for opportunities to appear throughout the trading day. Uh, that would be a, what we'd define as a day trader. Uh, on the other side of things, you've got the long-term investors, the Warren Buffett types, that uh, often have uh, a deep-seated interest in the company. They probably have scotch with the owner of the companies on time to time, uh, and in Buffett's case, in fact, might have influence of how the entire company is in fact run. Um, they're dealing with big amounts of money. They can't get in and out for a ten cent or one dollar movement because they're dealing with too much money. They are the market. Um, and therefore more looking at those longer term trends. Uh, think of it like the jet ski in the water versus, versus the Titanic. And somewhere in between, you get a marriage of both. You get the swing trader. And uh, this is my favorite of all, is uh, between swing trading and day trading. And uh, this is where we kind of, we, we don't want the company to obviously be go bankrupt tomorrow. We've got to make sure that the fundamentals are strong if we're buying. But we're looking for that short term move Uh, to take advantage of. Okay, so if you, uh, if you, each of these appeals to you, uh, or any of these particular appeal to you, just throw it up there. And of course, options is the overlay uh, on top of these things. So um, just throw up there in the chat box and let me know uh, where your background is coming from in a trade from a trading perspective, or, or perhaps where you're looking to move towards. A lot of swings. Day trading swings, options, swings in options. <laughs> All right, my kind of crowd. All right, so now these, these are, these are um, uh, slides you've probably seen before uh, because they're in every kind of financial presentation that I've ever been to is, uh, you know, what are you looking for? What kind of objective? Now, it, it may sound cliche, but, but this is important to consider as well, because building a trade plan, you, again, hear me talk a lot about plans as well. Uh, building a trade plan is it's very important to be aligned with, with what you want. Uh, if your objective, well, for example, my objective when I got into trading was uh, uh, I saw the amounts of money made on Wall Street. I knew 22-year-olds that drove Ferraris. Uh, where I see 65-year-olds who can't afford a Volvo, and I just thought, wow, there's a lot of money in this market to be made if you know the right spots. Um, but I also didn't want a, uh, to die at the age of 30 from stress. So uh, for me, trading was about, can I take a small piece of that every day and do it in a way that allows me to have freedom to pursue the things I want? Traveling, starting other businesses, starting businesses like Acorn, things like that. So for me, it was travel. And day trading, this wasn't necessarily the best suit because you have to be in front of the screen a lot more. So it's always important to consider your objective when starting out the strategy to make sure it is aligned with what you enjoy and what you do well. And this will then start feeding into, of course, the, uh, uh, the strategy side of things. So um, this is a question I would like to pose to you. Uh, obviously, in the last side, that's going to vary quite a lot. But how do you make your decisions? Um, it may vary, but is it from newsletters and uh, trading rooms and things like that? Is it from newspapers? Is it from tips from friends and other traders? Is it from uh, uh, financial advisors? Or is it uh, things that you're familiar with? In which case, uh, this is actually a picture of Vancouver, and this exactly here <laughs> is where I'm sitting while I talk to you at the moment. Technical analysis, okay. Technical and fundamentals to a lesser degree, great. Technical analysis, okay. So news that matches the chart formation, interesting, we'll come back to that. Most people um, 
have this kind of uh, uh, similar mindset of looking at technicals, looking at fundamentals, but when they start to implement the ideas, emotions kick in. I don't know how many traders I've talked to that have gone through $5,000 workshops, uh, spent ten thousand, some, some people $20,000 on these week-long courses, and, uh, and they get great education. They could tell me up and down what a head and shoulders was, um, what a, uh, a sending wedge, what a spinning top, hangman formation, understand what volume is. They know all of the textbook stuff. They've watched all the YouTube videos. But then it comes to actually making money, and they're, not, they're, they're treading water. If, if anyone feels like they're in that boat, by the way, uh, put your hand up, because you wouldn't be the only one. And that seems to have been the common theme to a lot of students that I've worked with recently. They're all, they're all well educated, but they're just not making money. Um, so what happens is when the, the book smarts meets the street smarts, that's where the problem is, because they don't have a really exact, excuse me, <coughs> an exact action plan. They don't have a business plan. It's kind of, you know, just a bit all over the place. So they, they get into trades. They fail to limit losses. They average down. They, um, they buy into emotions. So they see a stock that they knew was a good one, but they didn't buy it because they were gun shy. It shoots up. They buy it. After it's already up 5%, it turns around, drops. They sell it. And then it goes up again, and it's this constant roller coaster of emotion where uh, so many people have told me they feel that the market is literally looking over their shoulder to sell the moment that they buy. Uh, you know, this stuff is not uncommon. Believing in public information, so buying because News Corp says that Apple's on a tear, you know, selling on pullbacks, getting rattled out of stocks. These are all things, though, that come from, uh, uh, from basically lacking a strategy. It's why 95% of people lose money. I mean, how can that be? If you just threw darts at a dartboard and picked stocks that way, you've got a 50% chance they're going to go up and a 50% chance they're going to go down. So if, if that's the odds, 50-50, how on earth are 95% of people failing? Well, because the one thing that everyone has in common is emotions. And the next thing that most people have in common is that they lack a strategy. Well-educated, but just don't have the execution. Uh, and sometimes not well-educated at all. Um, and again, not surprising with all this noise. There's a gentleman I got off the phone with two weeks ago. He's, he's told me he'd been trading for 10 years and only just started making money in the last 12 months. But he'd, he, I mean, I don't know how many different books he quoted and courses he'd done. Again, well-educated, but was constantly having style drift. They, they call it style drift because he's always looking it over his shoulder with the next biggest chaotic event, the next best trading strategy or new indicator, uh, the next best whiz-bang you know, uh, whiz rally or crash, and all of this other noise to go with it. It's constant distraction, constant misinformation that's leading you down uh, a different path every day. And they might all be good strategies, but you can't be good at every strategy. So what you really have to do is you have to specialize. You have to pick an exact methodology that you're going to be good at. You know, you know, like you wouldn't want to come to a webinar hosted by Acorn Wealth Corporation if Acorn Wealth was uh, technical trading experts uh, that also sold microwaves, <laughs> right? Because that just doesn't make sense. You wouldn't go to a restaurant that serves 30 different entrees. Probably wouldn't taste any good. You pick somewhere that's the best at what they do. And, and in the business of trading, you've got to pick what your specialty is going to be. So think about that. If you were to sit down and I said, well, like a chef, write down your recipe for the meal that you can cook the best. Well, if you were to sit down and I said, here's a pen, draw for me exactly what the chart would look like if it was perfect, if it was cooked to perfection, so to speak. What would, it, what would it be? What would the shape of the chart be? What would the pattern of the candlesticks be? Um, and then once you've found the right personality of the chart, so to speak, what would the conditions be? So uh, what would the P to E ratio be? 
Insider trading, would they be buying, are they selling? If so, how much? What about the short float? What about the MACD? What about the technical indicators? What would they be indicating? Because of course, depending on the type of trade you're doing, you, you'll be looking for significantly different things from different indicators, just like a recipe. You use it all differently. And as Bob says, yeah, you're right, absolutely. And once you have that plan, you plan that trade, and you trade your plan. So would you know exactly what these systems would be? Uh, the analogy I always like to use, because it kind of gets the point across clearly, is if you were to go out and buy you know, a car, and you had uh, two kids and a wife, you live in the middle of Calgary or uh, somewhere in the Midwest now that's uh, freezing over, uh, you know, you don't go out saying, okay, well, I want, uh, you, know, you go out and you say, I want a four-seater four or five-seater, I want snow tires, maybe I want ski racks so I can take the kids snowboarding on the weekend, uh, I need a boot in the back because they play soccer during the summer, and, um, and so forth. And, hey, my budget's 30 grand. If you came back that afternoon with a two-seater convertible with slick tires and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and no room for the kids, you can imagine how well that decision would go down. But people do it all the time with stocks. Uh, they buy things because they're afraid of missing out on opportunities. They sell things because they're afraid of loss. Uh, there's no real structure. They don't have a shopping list. And uh, the, the old saying that I like to always tell people is if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. And it's important that you know what that path is uh, that's right. I, I think the, the, the decision that people struggle with is deciding which way is right. And unless you've had 12 years of experience like I've, I've, like I've got in my trading, uh, it's very hard to quantify what's a good method versus a bad. So you're kind of just stuck exploring everything, which is very costly for your time and very costly to your pocket generally as well. So let's, let's backtrack a bit. Let's talk about how we came up with these strategies. And excuse me if, if anyone here is fairly advanced, if this is rudimentary, but I like to set, I always believe that it's far more important to understand why something works or why it was created than, than what to do. Um, so everything we talk about, we'll, I'll always explain why we do it a certain way and what makes it powerful before I tell you what to do, or what we do at least. So the question that we kind of set out to ask was, all right, if there's, if there's hundreds of ways to trade and all of them possibly can make money, uh, how do we start deciding which would be the most powerful? And it made sense to me to ask the question then, well, uh, who controls the market? Uh, if I pose that question to everyone here, what would you say? What would be, who do you think controls the market? Yeah, big money, smart money. You know, the, the um, JP Morgan, uh, Goldman Sachs, some of the high-frequency trading firms, the Feds, yeah, the big money. So let's, 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 let's go higher level than that. Let's say this, volume dictates price. So whoever controls the volume controls the market. So who controls the volume? Well, as you said, it's the smart money. So now we've kind of narrowed that down a little bit. The next question would be, okay, well, this, this smart money that's dealing with billions of billions of dollars, how much do they represent? They actually represent 70 to 80 percent of the market's trades. And 70 to 80 percent of the market's trades isn't even coming from the likes of a Kyle Ar Carl Archon that says, I'm going to buy here and I'm going to sell here. The majority of these trades that make up the smart money have nothing to do with someone sitting at a desk with a coffee cup pushing a button. It's to do with program trades or algorithmic trades that are done by computers completely separate from any human interaction. Now, this is a figure that was estimated three years ago. I can only imagine that it's higher or at least the same now. And these are basically bots uh, are, some, are programmed weeks, sometimes months uh, ahead to say when this stock meets this price, buy it. And when it hits this, so 10 bucks, buy it. And when it hits 20, sell it. And then drive it back down to 10 bucks again and do it all over. That's how 
uh, that's how money is made. If you're the smart money, if you can move the market, how do you make the most amount of money? You make the most amount of money by sending something from 10 to 20 and back down to 10, back up to 20 as many times as you can. That is a printing machine and that's what they do. So uh, yeah, we're going to be talking, David, about the, how they do that because that is really, I think, the high value question is how do we tag along to these uh, as a kind of a fly on an elephant's back and take a little bit of a ride for a bit of that profit because billions of dollars are made doing that. Now, if you want to, let's just talk a bit of background before we get into specifics. Um, if you want to look at the background of the power of this, uh, these forces caused the crash of May 2010. Remember May 6, 2010, who remembers that? They, the, mark, the Dow Jones plunged a thousand points, lost about six months of gains in half an hour. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're talking about massive amounts of money. Uh, let me put it this way. If you have a 100 ton truck going 160 kilometers or 200 miles an hour, uh, other way around probably, anyway, if you've got a 100, 100 ton truck hurtling down a highway at this speed and all of a sudden it comes to an exact stop instantly and turns ex straight around and goes 180 degrees at the exact same speed at whence it came, that's pretty impressive. Like what kind of power, stopping power and accelerant power would it take to do that? Nothing I've seen on this earth. In the stock market, the type, that type of power is the smart money. And this is when you, now, so yeah, they told us it was a fat finger, but uh, this is going to be, um, this is, this is not fat finger. Markets don't crash like that because someone pushes a B button. This is, that might have been one of the, the, uh, the dominoes that went over, but it, it wasn't the finger that pushed it. It would have been algorithms. Much like I don't believe that the NASDAQ got shut down last year because somebody tripped over a power wire. <laughs> uh, I mean, if you, uh, in this day, modern day and era, the NASDAQ, which specializes in technology companies, got shut down because somebody tripped the power wire. No way. So, but that's what they tell you. So, what we want to actually start looking at is, I mean, and, 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 and some people say, say they, at this point they go, well, John, geez, this is scary as hell. So you're telling us the market's manipulated. You know, what chance does a small guy like me have then if all of this is going on? How do we compete? Well, the, the beauty about this is the fact that this is a, a well-known kind of uh, thing amongst the trading community, but hardly anyone off the street that I can meet or talk to uh, has really ever gotten into it in any depth because the job of the financial system is to keep this kind of on the inside. This is how they make money. Remember, for one person to make money, someone else has to lose. So for, and seeing as that, uh, that ratio of the winners to losers is heavily shifted towards the smart money, they need a lot of people like you, not you specifically, but we, they need a lot of public to be wrong because that's who buys the stock when they need to get out, right? But so that's, that's why it's such a shroud of, of confusion and chaos because the financial system is not there to help you. It's there to make money. It's a business. So you start to say, okay, well, how can we figure this out for ourselves? Well, the idea of smart money is that it, it, it's a system. It's, it's a strategy. And because they're computers that implement this strategy, they're doing the same thing again and again and again. Right? That it's rule based. So although it looks chaotic, it's really just a series of different patterns being played out. Uh, we just had the Super Bowl. Think of that. In the Super Bowl, when two teams are playing against each other, the coach on either side has its playbook. All these different patterns which the players can run and where the ball gets sent to and when it gets there what to do. If you think of the stock market like that, the market makers or the smart money, they're the coach. They've got the, play, they've got the playbook and the other team is you. And their job is to, is to keep shifting through different patterns, different plays to keep you on your toes to get past you. Okay, so, but if the, once you start to see this, once you start to detect it, these plays all have rules. 
which you can reverse engineer. And that's where we started about eight years ago uh, in ACORN, starting to reverse engineer patterns that we saw happening again and again and again that were almost identical and started tracking, A, how to, how to figure it out, how to, how to detect the fingerprint, and secondly, uh, what, what the probabilities were of where it would go when we did. And that's where, uh, that's where we started to cook with gas. So the first step in doing that is to, uh, is to understand some, you know, some core statements, you know, some, some things that we can build everything off. Uh, much like a uh, a vision for a business. Again, thinking talking about plans here. So, if we start to strip all the noise off, start from square one. How does a stock move? Well, basically, it's it is my belief and what I've seen in practice that a stock or index or commodity or, or whatever you want to be trading only cha only changes direction because it's hit one of a few things. A, a horizontal support or resistance line. That's first. B, a trend line. So a diagonal line. Or C, a moving average. Now, um, and that's right, Bob, most of the indicators are lagging. So um, this is the most important thing, because this tells us um, about where a stock could possibly change direction. What's holding it up, what's holding it down, and where the power is on a chart. So algorithms don't see this. They don't see what you and I see when we look at a chart. What algorithms see when they look at something like that is this. They see levels. So you look at the flash crash of 2010. Let's go back to that example. You can see that it came, uh, this was a pretty nasty crash in itself. It came down from uh, 1150 straight down to this 1060 zone and just like magic turn right around think of that 100 ton truck and went straight back up to resume a huge rally hit 1220 bounced around on this support level this level at 1180 and then it broke it and the B button so to speak the the the, the flash crash occurred came all the way down to this price again at 1060 and went straight back up again. So, uh, you know, I, just a hypothetical question I pose, how valuable would it have been to know ahead of time that 1060 was the price to buy anything with a ticker symbol? You know, very valuable, obviously. And I realize it's hypothetical, but I'm going to show you some real examples here in a minute. So, um, the key is to reverse engineer how to find that level, how to know when the smart, where the smart money is going to buy. So the first step is finding the strong levels. Now, uh, GoToMeeting has never been fantastic about its pen, so I'm just going to see if you can see this first. Can, you, can, any, can anyone see that pen that I've just drawn on the screen? That's great. That's the first time that's worked. <laughs> All righty. So let me just erase that, and I'll start again. So um, basically, with... With the smart money, let's, let's, again, think of this like a reverse engineer. If we're detecting the smart money, how does a computer buy? How, how does a computer buy? And I, I don't expect anyone to get this, but anyone want to guess? What's the behavior? Or what, what does it look like when a computer buys? It buys instantly. It doesn't wake up late. It doesn't have an argument with its kids. It buys because uh, this number equals the rule it was told to buy at. So when something comes down, if it's an algorithm reacting, it's going to be like putting a match to a flame. It's going to react. If it's retail buying, it's going to look like this. Now, both of these are valid trades. This would be more of a momentum trade. This would be what we call an oscillating trade. Both are valid. But what do you think I'm more interested in? Am I more interested in, in the type of move where Goldman Sachs putting 100 million bucks in? Or when uh, 
everybody down the road is starting to buy because they, they you know, heard about it around the water cooler. I'm more interested in this because that's the, that's the most powerful move. It's where 70 to 80 percent the, of the market's putting its money behind. So while these two are both valid, I don't necessarily want to trade them both. I want to trade the one that makes me money the quickest. So um, when I see this, this is the first thing that we need to see when we see a stock. We want to see, hey, is there a strong drop, a strong fast drop straight down that goes straight back up again? Not over five days, straight back up. The other thing we want to know is, did it go up significantly? Okay, if because again, think of it this way: we talked about how the, the the buffets of the world buy. They're the Titanic; they can't jump in, jump out within within seconds or days, right? They if they're going to be taking a move, you can bet this this is a planned, executed project. It's not a one day trade. This is going to have to move a fair bit with a fair amount of volume to give them the opportunity to, to maneuver themselves in and maneuver themselves out. So they need to be able to push it up so they can buy through this zone and sell through this zone. Right? Okay, so we need to see significant movement. And now what we're looking for, now that we have detected this fingerprint here, excuse my scribble, but there you go. <laughs> so we're looking for the uh, we're looking to detect that fingerprint, and because it's an algorithm, because it's a computer, we're, we're we're hedging our bets that the next time it comes down here, it's probably pretty likely that they still have that same order waiting to execute at least one more time, because that's how they make money. Do it again. Now, there's one more thing that we look for in this type of setup, and I'll, I'll draw you back to my uh, football analogy one more time. If you, were, if you were watching this Super Bowl play, and again, you're going up against the opposition coach, what's the chances that the coach on the opposite team is going to throw the same play four, five, six times in a row? What's the chances in, in one game that on a Super Bowl field they're going to throw a Hail Mary six times in a row? That's right. Nil. Slim. <laughs> okay. Why? Why? <laughs> I was going to answer it myself, but everyone's getting the answer so well. Tell me why. Why don't they play the same play? Too predictable. That's right, because the job, their job is to, is to play plays that are not being expected. So the third thing that we look for in a stock when we're looking for the smart money is realize they're not fools either. They're not going to bounce it off the same level six times. It, it happens. But I can tell you, when I first started trading, for probably the first five, six years, I always thought, logically, that the more times something had bounced, the, more, the stronger it was. It's actually the opposite. The least, less times it's bounced, the stronger it is. So the, the, the best time to buy is if you could figure out where trade one would be. That's, that's a bit tougher. You can do it. You can use Fibonacci's, pattern definitions, head and shoulders, things like that. You can find it. And these are the, these are the best ones because you get the most powerful move. The, the, the second, though, and easier trade to start with is number two. That's the best trade if, for, for someone starting out. Trade three, maybe, if everything else was just gung-ho. But after that, forget it. So the rule of three, I call that. I don't trade every support. I don't trade a pattern three times. Three times, and it's done. So let me give everybody a quick, a quick test to see, make sure everyone's listening so far. Uh, so out of, don't, and don't be shy to guess, out of these trades, let's say that this is the stock you're looking at. This has already happened. So you're looking at it on this day here, and you're looking for the highest probability trade. Would you wait for it to come down to A and buy it? Or would you buy it right now at B? Would you wait for it to come up to C to short it? 
or up to D to short that. What's everyone think? There is no wrong answer, remember. Every answer is correct, it's just a different way of thinking. So yeah, so a lot of people saying A and D. That's what I would go through, go for. Now, um, I saw another good answer there, which was uh, small position at B, full position at A. I want to come back to that one. That's a, that's a really interesting point. But the highest probability would be A, because at A, it's only hit it once. And when it hit it, it went up one, two, three levels. So it's a strong level and it's a fresh level. If we look at B, it's already hit once, twice, this is the third time, and it only went up one level before. Same with C, also been tested twice already. This would be the third time if it went up here. Now, D is also favourable. It's the second favourite because this has also only been hit once, but unlike A, it only went down two levels. It's a little bit less powerful. Still valid, though. So I would have picked A and D. Now, I do often, um, it's very common that people do pick B. Or, uh, excuse, excuse my scribble again, but um, why, we, why would we pick why would we not pick B or why would we not take us why would we be perhaps lured into buying at B? Generally, the reason why somebody would buy at B uh, is and I wish I, I probably need a slide about this. It's because they have the FOMO disease. Now the FOMO disease is the fear of missing out. People want to get in just in case it doesn't go below. Uh, I would argue never be afraid of missing out on a lower probability trade. Just wait for these ones. And uh, you're right, a B could be the start of an uptrend. You could be getting something like that. So what I would always do is I would generally wait till just below that second, uh, that, that bottom level. Let me just quick check, check back at the question. So. Uh, now we need to find a magic ball to find that trade. <laughs> I'm going to show you some of that stuff in a second. We're going to get off the PowerPoint and bring up some live charts. And yes, we'll bring up the SPY as well. All right, so let's, um, let's push on. So again, last test. If we had two stocks, same day, same market conditions, and we're looking for a short. Thank you so much there, Bruce. <laughs> Good to see you. A and B are our two choices. Which one would we short? Which is the higher probability? Excellent. Yep. I go with B as well. Thanks. That's great. That's the first time I've seen so many Bs in a row. I must be talking properly tonight. <laughs> okay, so let's go to the checklist. So now, once we've got some of these th this foundations down, now you can take the next step, the next kind of true statement. So if we, are, if we can build into our psyche that the stock will not change unless it hits a certain level, then our whole job, if you just want to take it back to real rudimentary stuff, our whole job simplified as a trader is to simply know when, where these levels are and buy when it hits one and sell before it hits the next because there's nothing to stop it between those levels. That's what we call the free money. The trick to being a great trader is to know which of these lines is the most likely it will go up at and that's where this smart money comes in just to kind of break this down full circle. Okay, we'll skip forward again. So uh, the next kind of statement we want to uh, lock into our psyche is that uh, uh, the smart money does need to agree for the, for the stock to change direction. It's just too powerful. Um, and even if you're right, even if you're a great fundamentalist and you've been able to discover a diamond in the rough that's five bucks that in 12 months' time will be 50, um, that's great. 
But if the smart money doesn't agree yet, and, it, and if you've figured something out that everybody else in the world hasn't, uh, it's still going to be sold off. And that might go from five all the way down to one before it finally turns up and goes to 50. So um, that's a tough ride to stay in for. And that's how a lot of people get burnt uh, on things like Nortel and all those other too big to fails types. So uh, this is why the fingerprint's important. The checklist you want to get down are these, uh, these six things. Well, five, five things, really. What we talked about already is looking for high probability zones. So we want to find where those strongest levels are. How do we find those levels? By looking for very strong levels of buying previously, fresh levels, so no more than three times, and, and therefore powerful levels. What we then want to do is we want to correlate the trades with the market. And what I mean by that is to start looking at those smart money levels on, say, the S&P or what have you. And we can say, all right, the S&P is all the way up here. So is, this, is the market a bullish market or a bearish market? That's very bullish. It's gone up huge. But if it's at resistance, that's the difference between telling you what the market was and what the market's going to be next. So understanding these levels will give you an instant roadmap of saying, am I looking for bullish or bearish stocks by understanding where the market's at in regards to its levels and where the smart money's going. Okay, so... Here is an excellent example of a stock that actually came up in our scans uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, I, so I just replaced this slide today because it was, it was just a, an easy one to show you how this works. This is a company called Aaron's Inc. Symbol is AAN. And this isn't a small company. Trades, um, trades up to about 30 million plus a day. On some days, as much as 60 million bucks worth of uh, volume. So there's volume there to trade. It's not, uh, you know, 10,000 shares a day or anything like that. I want you to have a look. Back in April of 2012, what happened here? Came hurtling down, hit this price of 24.50, and went straight up to 28 bucks in about two weeks. Strong, powerful level. Now, you wouldn't have really known that was there, but what was more valuable is a few months later when you saw it come down to that exact same price. And have a look at that. And this is, again, a big company. Came all the way back down to 2450 and in one day went all the way back up to that exact same price of $28. Not a coincidence. So... There's one example of a smart money zone or trade. Let me show you another one. Perhaps this had piqued your interest. This zone. You can see here, just on that previous slide, while we were spotting these, here's another one. $26.50. Comes straight down, straight up to 32 And back down. We'll talk about that one. So again, opportunity, of course. Next time it hits either here or here, you have a buy zone where you could take a long and it rallies once again right up to 29.50 from 26. That's uh, 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 yeah, $2.50 move, 10%. Um, and then a third time, That's exactly right, David, by the way. Yep, they ran the stops. But they ran them down to where the smart money was going to buy. So again, here's your third opportunity. Right here in the um, uh, late January of uh, 2014. And check it out. From 20, January, late January 2014 up to 32 bucks. And guess where we are now? At $32, again, on a stock that trades 30 to $60 million a day, we're at the same exact point that it shot straight down from, the smart money sell zone. Look what happened. Straight up, straight down. 
back to 28 bucks. So great long from 26.50 to 32, great short from 32 down to 29.28. Now you might obviously start to realize here that these sometimes when you get these massive movements, if you hadn't have been watching it that day, you might not have gotten out, and you might have, you might have bought it at 27 bucks or 26 bucks more likely, and found it all the way back down at 28 and missed a big profit. And this is why. There's that other little part to our webinar topic that says targets. The reason I can sleep well at night, or the reason I can, I spent six weeks in Australia over Christmas and through, through January, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't awake for the live markets once, because the markets opened at 12.30 at night. I was sleeping. Why could I sleep well at night, though? Because I knew that I had a strategy based on precise levels I've located in a chart where I know exactly where I want to buy. I know exactly where it's going to disprove my strategy, which would be where I get out and stop, stop out. I also know where the highest probability sell zone is based on my strategy. So I have a target. So once I've set this up, you can just let it go. And that's why swing trading is great. <laughs> now, um, so this is, this is a good example. Can you trade options on this? Absolutely. So once you've, once you've figured out the smart money zones, a huge step in the right direction. Next, you then start to apply your indicators. Now, indicators are lagging. And indicators are very dangerous because people get sucked into them because they get told by all these you know, wonderful things you hear that this is the golden grail, this is, uh, you know, every time the moving averages cross you buy, okay. Um, look, indicators were maybe the hot topic uh, seven years ago, but it's just not how the market works today. Uh, the market's so heavily driven by computers that you need to understand how they think, and most of the time that is levels. Um, the danger of indicators is they give you an easy answer that they give you the, what people see as a shortcut. Does the, does the MACD say buy? Yes, okay, I'm in. But it's not as simple as that. Uh, you need to know, if you're going to get a yes, no answer, what question you're asking. Because if I'm looking at a, a reversal trade, well, one of the things I look for, for a short, is the stock to be above its Bollinger Band. However, if I'm looking for a flag formation, which is a massive breakout trade to the upside, guess what? I'm looking for the exact same thing. I'm looking for the exact same reading for the stock to be above the Bollinger Band as one of my filters to find a long, as I do on another strategy to find a short. You've got to know what you're looking for from the indicator based on what the recipe is of that strategy. You have to have it. Otherwise, it's just uh, it's, it's just inconsistent and it's going to constantly m lose your money. So first that's important. Once you know what you're looking for, oversold, overbought, looking for your levels of volume to, inc to concur, to confirm, and then you start uh, confirming with price action tools like uh, uh, candlesticks, Bollinger Bands, um, those types of things. Does this work for FX? Pat, yes. Um, it works for, because uh, what, what we're doing here is we're not tracking a specific stock. We're tracking how money moves in the market. And money moves uh, in a very similar way across whatever you're trading. Um, now, the final step is then to increase the odds with charting patterns. And this is where sometimes it gets a bit hazy for people because there are probably about over a hundred patterns that are out there. The common ones are double tops, triple tops, head and shoulders, um, ascending wedges, rising wedges, falling wedges. You know, those are some of the key ones that you, you read about. Uh, and each of these patterns has a different probability of, of what it will do and how much it will make or lose when it does it. So for us, the next step after we spent a lot of time figuring this uh, previous concepts out, was then to work out, okay, if the stock is shooting down towards a smart money buy zone, how is it doing it? Does it have a really strong buy pattern? Is it coming down in a falling wedge? Or is it rallying up with a double top 
uh, understanding these uh, patterns and looking at what that pattern is on a daily chart and then having a closer look at what it is on a weekly, uh, excuse me, an hourly chart. And if you can get that to be bullish as well, that pattern to be bullish as well if you're looking for a long, well now you've got a really strong case to make. And so you've basically gone through your trade plan just like your recipe when you're buying a car having that specific value that you're looking for from every different part. And the final check is where is the smart money going? So we've talked about previous smart money buy and sell zones, but the final thing we're looking for is what the smart money is doing now in terms of the buying or selling of a stock. And I see a couple of questions that are coming in. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll answer those in a moment. Because what I want to show you just before we go to that is uh, the smart money. Now I'll bring this up on the chart. It's uh, just popping up here. Just let me know if you can see that. Can everyone see the chart? Bingo! <laughs> All right. Technology at its finest. Okay. So, um, so the final thing that I then use is to detect where the smart money is going now. So before I show you what smart money is, I again want to pose one last question. Um, what is the definition of an uptrend? How, what do you define is an uptrend? What have, you, what have you been taught? What do you learn? Again, there's no wrong answers, so feel free. Yeah. Higher highs and higher lows. Higher highs and higher lows. Right, exactly. That is the world round accepted definition of an uptrend. But I'd like to ask you something. If let's say that I had a lemonade stand and I sold a thousand lemonades today at a dollar, some for a dollar five, some for 95 cents, but an average price of a dollar, a thousand bucks. Tomorrow I decide business is so good, I'm going to change my prices to ten dollars and I sell one for ten dollars ten and the second one for nine dollars ninety. Well, don't I have higher highs and higher lows? But would you suggest my business is making more money or less money? Because I'd suggest that my lemonade stand's about to go out of business. Uh, pr price change is the easiest way to to create false sense of direction. That's why breakouts often are fake outs. I could show you a great example of price line, which is one we call as a, a fake out because of this reason, and it was. Um, you need a few things. You don't just need price. You also need volume. Price has to go up, but so does volume with it. The other thing it also has to do is the range should not contract. Okay, if you get a, a stock that's going up and it's making higher highs and higher lows, but it's contracting in range, that's a bearish pattern. Also something to be aware of. Uh, and, and furthermore, finally, if we want it to be going up, we need to look at the price action in terms of its range. We need the volume to be going up. And we also need the stock to be closing in the top half of the range. Because when it stops, close, stops closing in the top half of the range, like for example here, that's a bearish signal. So we need all three things, higher highs, higher lows, higher price, strong price action, and high closes in the range period to period. If all of that's happening, you truly do have an uptrend because it means that the smart money is buying and holding, not pushing price off to sell into it. And so when we start to look at smart money, 
you'll see this on the chart on the bottom, this line actually indicates how all three things are coming into play together at the same time. Okay, now, oops. Okay, so um, let's now take this and uh, you can see what we've got on the bottom. The higher the number is, it means that there's accumulation going on. If it's a number below zero, it's distribution. Obviously, what we want to see in the long is we want to see this going up. If we're looking for a short, we want to see it going down. And going down below zero would be even better. That's how we apply apply that. Now, I want to uh, now show you an example. Someone was asking about the SPY earlier. One of the things that, oops, one of the things that uh, this has been excellent for is it's predicted every major break in the market. Well, most of them. Um, let's go back a little while. The key thing you look for is you start to see that whenever this breaks below zero, it's usually a big red flag, major problem. What's more powerful, though, is the early warning sign that you get from it. The early warning sign is when a market continues going up and at the same time the smart money is getting out. Bingo. Big warning. Break below zero. Same thing over here. Uh, where's June 6? June 6 is when we got our key exit signal. June 6 there, breaking down below zero, divergence, exactly Bob. And if you, if you use this purely as a get out when it's gone zero and get back in when it goes above, I can tell you, you miss very little profits. Uh, it's, a great, it's a great overall macro indicator regardless of, of uh, what type of trader you are. And look at where this goes positive again right here in, uh, in early April 09. And it stays positive for the whole period of the real recovery. All the way up. All positive. All positive. Oh, look at that. It's drops again, heading down. You got your, uh, got your break there below zero. Warning sign. Break below zero. So I'll fast forward. You can it's a very powerful thing. I've used it every day since 2008, every single day. Um, uh, now, this is something, now, have a look at what happened as we were building in the late part of last year. Everyone kept saying, why, do you, why are you calling this market to drop? Why are you saying there's something nasty going to happen? Well, one of the big things that I was really worried about is that without knowing what the smart money thought exactly would happen, I could see that they were worried. Because as the market kept rallying from November on, this thing was falling apart. And right here, as we create this double top, you can see we have this nasty divergence on the money flow. So this was one key thing that's problematic. Now, before we change off the S&P, where are we at now? Well, throw your Fibonacci on. And you will see that we've gone straight up and we've hit one of the key Fibonacci levels on the nose today, which is why I'm bearish going in, was bearish going into today's trades, um, and uh, why I uh, feel that's going to be at least a short-term pullback. Anyway, we won't get too much into that quite yet. Now, how has the smart money worked on other stocks? Have a look at Apple. AAPL. Apple rallied. Went from 530 bucks to 570. What happened to the money flow? It did not. It fell apart. And then if you have a look at the smart money zone, it goes up, hits a top, straight down, 
rallied up, hit a top, people saw the gap up, probably got excited, I would have been selling it. I wasn't in Apple, unfortunately, on that trade, but I would have been shorting the hell out of that. Uh, for those of you who were in that webinar, you'll remember I, I talked about this being a smart money, great example of smart money. Again, look at the money flow. All the way down here, despite the price being at an equal high, so it's a double top, and a smart money sell zone, and the smart money indicator confirmation. Uh, what was I looking for here? Um, okay, yeah, here, and then when as you come down, and you consolidate this triangle ahead of the next big drop, look what happens to the money flow. Now we're all the way down here, we're breaking in, price action is poor, big drop. Uh, joy manufacturing, emerging market play, smart money sell zone, comes straight up to that same zone again at 58.50, divergence on the money flow, nice drop, potential shorting opportunity there from 58.50 down to uh, down to here at 55 or lower. I'll uh, yeah, I'll chat about the indicator here in a second. Um, I'll we'll put it all together for you. So the money flow is actually, uh, it's a money flow uh, indicator that we use. Um, so what we, uh, what we do is it's actually something that's an adjustment of chalk and money flow. Is, it, is, it, is what it bases off, but it's actually tweaked in combination um, with the scan. So this is actually called a twigs money flow is this indicator that's, uh, that's on here. And then what we do is we add on to that our proprietary um, early signals, which are what, how we get the scans to work for them. So I'll come back to some other live charts here in a second. Um, I'm just conscious and conscientious of time, so I want to let go through the rest of your slides here. But this is so important because this tells you what's going on. You know, have a look. Just one final thing before we do switch off the charts. I mean, take a look at uh, DDD. Maybe some of you watched uh, this. This was a live pick from the trading room where I was applying this same tactic. Now, this is a bit of a different smart money sell because you can see that it was all the way up here versus a horizontal level. But uh, you can see straight there, lovely head and shoulders pattern. Smart money was bailing out, and you got this beautiful drop down from 90 down to 58. The option traders out there would have loved this. This uh, the options, the put options on this, went up 700 percent over that period. Okay, and uh, one I bought some puts on today was IBM. Just took a small position in this one. It's a very similar reason, apart from the fact that the insiders themselves have been selling the stock in droves for the last few weeks at 177 and 180, 78 and so forth. Anyway, so that's uh, just another little tidbit. But um, all of this put together, when you put all of this together, now you have an action plan. Eh? Um, and this is where your probabilities really increase. And that's the key. The trick to being a great trader is not being a general practitioner. It's about knowing the probabilities and knowing the odds and sticking to them. Uh, in poker, how good of a player would you be, how much money would you make, if you had the opportunity of only playing when you had pocket aces? Only playing when you had pocket aces. You'd, you'd be doing great. You don't get to do that, though, because you, you, you have to pay blinds. You have to put some money in each time. So you don't just get to sit there and wait for the best cards. The thing about the stock market is if you know what the best cards are, if you know what a strategy or a high probability is that you're going to win, and you know how to find those, you do get to see your hand for free. You get to look at the chart and decide whether you want to buy it or not before you put any money in. So why not scan for pocket aces? Most people, though, don't know what each hand's probability is. They don't know where the lines are. The difference between a great trader who makes good money and a well-educated trader who loses a lot is somebody who has the exact same book knowledge but no idea how to, tr to, to put it into place. If you draw the lines on, on the chart, the wrong way, at the wrong angle, it completely changes your targets of where you get in and where you get out. 
And I see students do this all the time. They, like, they've learned all these different techniques from somewhere, and they know that are head and shoulders, they buy here and sell here. But I notice that they've drawn the lines on wrong, so they're buying right underneath the ceiling and selling it as soon as it gets above it, <laughs> which should be the opposite way around. So, but without exact methods of knowing this, it's very difficult to do. Um, and if you don't have that consistency, there's no way for you to get consistent results. If you have a big win, big trade that wins a lot, of, wins really well for you, you should be able to know how to replicate it 50 times over, or it's useless to you. It's just one win. Same with a loss. Uh, if you take a loss, you should know, was it really a loss because you did something wrong, or was it a loss because you're just unlucky? Because if it was just because you were unlucky, you shouldn't change anything. Or you might change something that's actually working well on the other 50 trades you do. But again, you have to have that plan to be able to, to gauge that. Um, uh, and finally, are you being efficient? Even if you are doing really, really well. Uh, I, I know some traders that do great, but they're spending like you know, 12 hours a day uh, studying, analyzing multitudes of stocks. So my, one of my professors told me, you know, what's the definition of wealth? You talk about this in the four-hour work week, actually, too. Um, who's the wealthier guy? A guy who works 100, 100K a year working 60 hours a week or 60K a year working 10 hours a week? Uh, I'd argue the latter. And so in terms of trading, uh, is it worth spending six hours a day to hypothetically make, say, 10% a month? Or in that same example, if you could do 6 to 8% a month working 30, 40 minutes a day, which would you choose? So while swing trading might not have the illustrious appeal of being able to leverage your money four times over, uh, I would argue that the benefits of the time it saves you by, and the sleep it saves you by knowing exactly where you want to get in and out and just to let it go is worth it. That's just my opinion. But the other advantage to this is that once you know what you're looking for, you can scan for it. Uh, you can scan the entire market. You can look for exactly what you want. When you know what you're looking for, it's, it's actually quite simple. You, you can go through stock after stock after stock doing what we call the blink test, saying, does this round plug go through my round hole? No, next one, next one, next one. And, and, and you see this when I go through scans. You can see that you know, we generally spend no more than about five seconds because we know exactly what we see, want to see on the screen. And if it takes us longer than five minutes, we simply just move on. So exact entry and exit points is what we're looking for. Work's usually finished in 20 minutes, and then we can also have our scanners alert us to the, uh, to the, um, the warning signs where markets start to fail. Um, next steps. If, hopefully you like what you hear. This is a, a great time to be doing this. It's the best time that we've had in terms of efficiency of this strategy. Uh, we're finding trades every day. Normally, 8 to 12 stocks that really look perfect is a good, good target. We're finding a lot more than that at the moment. Um, uh, we've actually seen a, probably one of the best conditions for trading in the latter part of last year and the beginning of this year. Um, this, I, I could talk about the strategy's performance later, but it's, it's been uh, doing uh, probably as good, if not better, than October to December 2008, which was uh, the last time we saw kind of the type of numbers we are now. Uh, we do, this reason we are doing a special uh, standalone two-hour class where we're going to be going through, obviously I can talk for hours, you might be able to tell that already, uh, <laughs> um, but this is where we can really kind of take this and turn it into practical application, which is obviously where the, um, where, you, where the rubber hits the road. We want to talk about profitability, probability, and predictability, and making sure that you're in that sweet spot where, where all three are right. Um, for most of you, uh, this is uh, maybe one of the first workshops you've done with us, and uh, so we have uh, put a very attractive price on it. It's uh, the two-hour workshop is actually a uh, a module from one of our six-month courses, one of the most valuable modules from it, um, which is a, a five thousand to ten thousand dollar course. Um, so this, you really will be able to get a lot of meat and actionable stuff out of this directly that you can go and use the very next day. Uh, we're going to be teaching you um, how to scan using free tools. We also can refer you to paid tools if you want, but we'll be teaching you using ones that you can get for free. We'll be showing you um, exact trade setups using Finviz. Um, we'll be showing you how to um, scan for a highly highly probable breakouts, such as Apple, such as DDD, such as Coach, such as Best Buy. These are all some of the examples recently. Um, 
uh, of what we engineered that scan to find. Of course, that's very valuable when you have uh, options in earnings season. Um, we'll also not just, again, not just teach you what. We want to teach you why. So we want everyone in the workshop to be able to learn the skills and the methodology of how to take an idea and build it in a free tool such as Finviz, uh, and we'll show you other ones such as Metastock and here in Incredible Charts, um, how to actually take an idea and build it into a scan, see if it works, and then implement it, and, and what indicators to look to use depending on what you're trying to trade. Uh, so we'll go and show you all of this. Um, other things to, to kind of narrow it down a bit more, other things you'll be learning, how to anticipate the changes in the market instead of reacting to them. Um, the things that go into a proper scan, so how to build triggers, conditions, and patterns. So I'll be showing you scans uh, where we use both, and I'll actually be teaching you these scans so that you can go away and start using them right after. Uh, so, you know, what type, how to find stocks, that have been shooting down, that are where the insiders have been loading up. Now, this was a great example, SNTA, where that happened. This was one that came up in one of the scans I'm going to show you. Came up here at $3.80. Insiders were buying it. Everyone else was betting against it. Things shot up from $3.80 to 5 bucks in about four days. This is also one of the scans you'll learn. Um, don't go broke on breakouts, so how to avoid fake outs by understanding the, the fingerprint of when the smart money is tricking you, and how to search for that high probability, low risk place to enter and exit. This is very important, because this is where you take the street smarts and apply it to the trade, knowing where what places to avoid, what numbers to avoid, because the market makers can see. Um, and a discipline checklist. Uh, everyone will leave with a checklist of exactly what things we're looking for from each of these scans we, we, we work with you on. And, um, and again, the key is not just to, to give you the fish to eat for a day, to use that example. It's also to teach you how to um, approach your trading with this mindset and even build your own scans if you want. Uh, one of the other final strategies we'll show you is how to scan for those heavily shorted stocks prime for big short squeeze rallies when there's really a lot of underlying strength, how to look at what the institutions are buying today, insiders buying today. It all fits into this um, a, a very kind of strategic way we take you through. Um, it takes about two hours and we take a five minute break in the middle for a coffee break or refill your glass of wine, whatever your <laughs> beverage of choice is. Um, and uh, yeah, look, you, you get a lot of value out of it. You can start using it and uh, obviously, um, the reason why we do this is so you can start seeing the effectiveness that scans have and be able to make use of some of these market conditions we have ahead. I'll just uh, have a quick look at um, uh, over there to see if there are any questions. Uh, so yeah, it is, it is 47 bucks. Um, you can register here at acornwealthcorp.com forward slash green. We had, uh, we've done it, I think, twice now since, uh, since we started this in December, uh, November, sorry. They've been full events both times. Uh, it is limited to 100 people because of the, uh, the coaching room that we use. It's, um, it's, a, it's a bit more intimate, uh, and we do have, uh, it's a very kind of intensive support that we offer with you throughout the process. So as you're leading up to the class, we actually send you prerequisite material, some instructional videos you can actually watch. Um, and, uh, and and see how the see how the scans work and and uh, start applying them even before the event so you can come to the event prepared and throughout the whole process leading up to February 27th you can call in talk to our coaches and uh, and ask questions so we limit it to 100 because that's really the kind of sweet spot where we can still guarantee a a high level of customer service. Um, the recording is recorded. Uh, David, if you've been in it before, a previous one, then you can come to the next one, absolutely. So I'll just have a quick look, see if there's questions regarding 
regarding that. Now, uh, in the session, we'll also, at the end of the two hours, we actually do an open forum question. So we'll actually be reviewing uh, the stocks that are coming up in the scans and picking potential uh, opportunities for the next day. Uh, this has been a very successful, we, again, we can't recommend to you what to buy or sell, that you have to do on your own, but we do uh, run the scan and show the analysis and what the smart money indicator is reading uh, on it. We've had some extremely success, some extremely good success over the last, uh, well, six years, but especially in the last six months. Uh, Pat FX, our, um, our head coach, is actually an FX only trader, one of our head coaches. His, uh, his day job is uh, one of the senior engineers for one of the major oil companies, but uh, his night job is trading and coaching with us as a hobby. And he, and he loves, uh, the stuff that we use is so applicable because you can use it on anything where money is moving. That's the key, is tracking how money is moving. So when you start to see, let me, let, for example, one of the things we're gonna teach you about this is really awesome. This is, uh, this is something that works on gold. So um, here's one of the things that we teach you. It's, uh, it's, a, it's an indicator on gold that works unbelievably well. Um, at the beginning of last year, we talked about shorting gold. We talked about the fact that we wouldn't, as a long, touch it with a 10-foot pole uh, because uh, of this indicator. And when I bring it up on the screen here, you'll see how accurate that has been. Okay. So, okay. So let's have a look here. You look over seven years, you actually see this indicator work. Look at how the stock, how gold respects this. I think it was, I did the statistics on it. It was uh, 13 times out of 19, it always rallied off this level. And the only times it broke down was when it, when it, uh, when it had big failures. At the beginning of 2013, we looked at this and said, ah, gold is in trouble. And right there on December 18th, 2012, it broke that level again, and it's been crashing ever since. The only time it even claimed close to recovering was back here on uh, the 29th of last year, and then it went straight back down again. And guess what? Guess where it is now? Another... Smart money buy zone, doesn't just work on stocks, there's your commodities. Smart money buy zone, came down here, we picked NUGT as the vehicle that we liked on this, it was 27 bucks at the time, and we took, looked at 45 as the target, and it went stra NUGT went straight from 27 to 45, but look at gold, look at where gold is now. Ran right into that level yesterday, and has turned has turned back again. One of the things that you'll be able to see in the webinar, we teach you this, uh, I teach you this as well. We really want to teach you kind of a different way of looking at the market. Uh, I'd be very surprised if the things that you learned in this webinar were anything you'd seen before. In fact, if you go through the webinar and you think it's not worth the $47, you email me directly and I'll refund you the very next day. Uh, I haven't had, I've only had one person do that, um, I, and I, I don't know why, but this is a great way for you to get started and action these, these types of setups immediately. So yes, the, the address there is acornwealthcorp.com forward slash green. acornwealthcorp.com forward slash green. It will be February 27th, it will be recorded, and one of the benefits is that if for any, any reason you miss it, for any reason you miss it, you'll actually be able to uh, attend one of the future sessions live, complimentary, as well as the recording.
Uh, should be, so I'll just show you. There you go, that, that's it. Acornwealthcorp.com forward slash green is the is this uh, website should take you to. That's my uh, that's my ugly mug up on the <laughs> up on the top. Acornwealthcorp.com forward slash green green for acorns. Why acorns? Because little acorns, big trees grow. Uh, February twenty seventh at eight p.m. Eastern should take you to that page if you type that in. Um, so yeah, that's on February twenty seventh. Now, uh, I'll just see if there's any, yes, it is in the evening. Again, we'll be recorded. And if you do have any other questions, I actually do have a, a coaching uh, obligation coming up in a few more minutes. And uh, we will be, yes, we will, uh, Marin, we will be actually teaching you that on the, in the webinar uh, on the 27th. You will get anything we've covered tonight, by the way, indica in terms of the indicators, um, the, uh, the indicator we use on gold, uh, some of the Finvis scans, you'll get immediate access to that so you can start using that before the webinar, idea being that when you come to the webinar, you're going to be able to uh, have a lot of questions prepared, even have some stocks that you've looked at that, uh, that, uh, that you like, questions that you have. You know, we're really here about giving you the why, a solid understanding of stuff you can go away and use, not just, you know, kind of buzzwords that sound good that don't do anything. All right. Well, everyone, hey, look, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I've got one last stock for you with a question before I have to go. Uh, UVXY, sure, I can have a look at that. Ah, the Ultra VIX short. Well, you have a look, it's, uh, it's something quite... What a great read on the, uh, on the chart there. Not a smart money trade I'd look at, but... Um, TSLA, however, God, this one was uh, this was, was this was a uh, very cool trade. Check this out: trend line the whole way up, the whole way up, upward channel, bang, 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 and then all of a sudden, smart money started selling off. Broke the trend line, tested from beneath, money flow continued to drop. This was a beautiful shorting opportunity. Uh, I, I watched this. Uh, <laughs> we, you know, just uh, we see these things happen. Best Buy was the same. Um, Facebook, another great example. Um, look at that. Facebook downward channel, bang, 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 bang. Broke out of the channel here. Look what happens. Same time, stocks at lower price. Smart money going up breaks through the positive, predicts this big rally up. Look at BlackBerry, however, consolidating, apparently, going sideways, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The average price of the stock does not change, but in this case, smart money does, shoots out. And big surprise comes to, it, comes to the end, comes to the pinch, and plummets down. Not really a big surprise. At this, the smart money generally knows what's happening. Whether they do know or whether they're just guessing well, uh, I don't care really, but um, what, I, what I do care about is following their actions. This is what the whole workshop's about, looking at where these high value, high probability trades are. Um, and uh, yeah, we play options before the gap. I'll be talking about it in the workshop. I've uh, gone way over my time. Actually, I've got a couple, uh, a couple of people in the next workshop expecting me in a few minutes. So I will finish it up there. Um, look, if you have any other questions or things like that, feel free to email um, coaching at acornwealthcorp.com. I've also got a team here at the office which will stick around for the next half hour to answer questions. Uh, you can call in at uh, um, 1877 272 2676 but I can see there's a bunch of people that have already come through and registered, so I wouldn't leave it too long. Um, again, you can call that number or follow that website to register. Uh, for everyone who's uh, already registered there, I'm looking forward to a great session. Uh, so, guys, have a very wonderful night. Thanks for spending your time with us tonight. It was a great pleasure, and uh, catch you on the flip side.